Hi, everybody. Welcome to SciTech's roundtable discussion on the long winding road of psychedelic legislation and regulation. This is an amazing panel that will take you to all corners of the ring in the battle for regulation change. I am pleased to introduce our moderator, Brad Bartlett. Brad is a litigator, legal and policy advisor and law professor and lecturer at University of Denver Stern College of Law. Brad has worked to pioneer legal and business strategies in the environmental cannabis, hemp and psychedelic space. His diverse array of clients include private and public traded cannabis companies, medical clinics, doctors and therapists, working with psychedelic treatments and therapies, as well as American Indian nations developing industrial hemp on tribal homelands. And at the moment, Michael Pollan's new film, How to Change Your Mind. Brad currently serves as general counsel for the Medicinal Mindfulness Center for Psychedelics, Spirituality and Sustainability, and is legal advisor to the Chikruna Institute for Psychedelic Plants and Medicines. Brad, thank you very much for moderating. And I'll now hand this over to you to introduce our amazing panelists. Oh, thank you very much, Deb. Well, as Deb said, my name is Brad Bartlett. I'm an attorney in Denver, Colorado, and I'm really honored to be moderating SciTech's roundtable discussion that Deb and I are calling the long winding road legal pathways towards psychedelic access in the United States. And we are really blessed today to have a distinguished group of panelists, including an attorney advancing precedent setting litigation for use of psychedelics in end of life care, to a public health professional that is working collaboratively to create a therapeutic access model for use of psilocybin in Oregon, to a public affairs professional that was instrumental in passage of the nation's first municipal initiative decriminalizing psychedelic mushrooms in the city of Denver, my hometown, to a state representative that introduced the nation's first legislative bill to decriminalize psilocybin and other entheogens in Idaho. So we're, gonna, uh, we're going to cover a lot of ground today. Uh, we'll spend time unpacking two of what I call the four legal, uh, I'm sorry, three of the four legal pillars underlying legalization of psychedelics in the United States, medical allowances, states' rights or local control, and we'll even touch on federal legal reform measures. Unfortunately, we won't have time today to get into the area of religious exercise with psychedelics, but we will save that topic for another day. I think most of us likely understand and appreciate that right now in 2021, the majority of psychedelic medicines in the, in the United States have some form of legal prohibition attached to them under the Federal Controlled Substances Act, a statute that was signed into law in 1970 by President Richard Nixon, a Republican, with support of an overwhelmingly Democratic Congress. Now, except for ketamine, the Controlled Substances Act classifies nearly all psychedelic medicines as Schedule I controlled substances, or what the law refers to as hallucinogenic substances. This includes uh, dimethyltryptamine or DMT, ibogaine, lysergic acid, diethylamide or LSD, marijuana, MDMA, mescaline, peyote, and both psilocybin and psilocybin. Now, as Schedule I controlled substances, it is currently the U.S. government's view that these substances have a high potential for abuse, have no currently accepted medical use and treatment in the United States, and that there is a lack of accepted safety for use of the substances under medical supervision. There are also substantial penalties for possessing and trafficking in these substances. Now, given the continued federal prohibitions, the work of today's panelists in advancing legal pathways towards psychedelic access becomes all the more relevant and important. So I wanted to start today's discussion with a 10 minute one-on-one -on -one conversation with each of our four panelists before turning to a 10 to 15 minute group discussion with the panel. And then we will close the round table by taking 10 to 15 minutes to answer some of your questions. So with that, I want to start with Kevin Matthews. Mr. Matthews is a highly regarded public affairs professional and founder of Vote Nature. Mr. Matthews was instrumental in spearheading the 2019 campaign to decriminalize psilocybin in Denver, the first initiative of its kind. Since then, Mr. Matthews has been a highly sought after advocate for strategic reform of prohibitions and psychedelics, and most recently found, founded Vote Nature, 
a platform to democratize psychedelic reform and empower more voices to change prohibitory laws. Mr. Matthews believes all people deserve the right to determine their own destiny with psychedelics and that citizens should have more power in the reform of our nation's prohibitions on psychedelics. Here, here, Mr. Matthews. Welcome. Kevin, good to see you again. Yeah. Thank you, Brad. It's yes. great to see you too. It's a real pleasure to be uh, here and to join all of these uh, esteemed panelists. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Last, last time we caught up, you were uh, actively engaged in the, in the Denver psilocybin, uh, psilocybin Initiative. That was a, a, a success, the first of its kind, really opened the door for uh, a lot of things that have come down the pike since. Maybe just spend a little time talking about your work on the initiative and where that is right now, because I know you're still actively part of, of that uh, initiative as it gets implemented. Yeah, that's correct. So um, one of the roles that I have right now is serving as the president of the Denver Psilocybin Mushroom Policy Review Panel. Um, that panel was, was mandated by Initiative 301. And uh, the mem folks who are on that panel include Denver's district attorney, um, city attorney, members of the Denver Police Department, the Denver Sheriff's Department, um, and other healthcare professionals and advocates of Initiative 301. And as the first panel of its kind in the nation, um, you know, we, we've had a really unique opportunity to not only collect more data over the past almost two years since we've passed decriminalization in Denver, but also uh, to help really set some, some powerful precedents and you know, another, exa another example for other cities to follow. And so the purpose of that panel was to review and assess the impact of decriminalizing psilocybin in Denver and looking at it from a, a health and fiscal and safety perspective. And um, in our last meeting, which we had in March of last year, um, everybody on the panel unanimously agreed that uh, decriminalizing psilocybin in, in the city and county of Denver um, has not since presented any um, major, major health or safety issue or risks in Denver, which was huge because as we were campaigning, um, you know, so many folks that we talked to uh, felt that the sky was gonna fall uh, with decriminalizing psilocybin in Denver and that we might be encountering um, an uncontrollable amount of people um, you know, using psilocybin mushrooms and uh, tripping in public, which uh, has not been the case. And it's been a real pleasure to, to work on that panel. You know, so much of our focus has been um, specifically on educating, um, you know, the folks who work with the city, uh, not only in terms of the, the, the clinical and medical research that's been conducted demonstrating the efficacy of psilocybin to treat, um, potentially treat depression and anxiety, uh, but also looking at it from a community-based perspective and risk and harm reduction and um, really allowing the panel members to kind of see the before and after um, of people's lives when they, when they have an opportunity to, to utilize psilocybin. So the, the thing that, that I've learned the most uh, in the past year since working on this panel that's actually surprised me the most is that the research and the data is incredible. And what I'm finding is that it's really folks' personal stories of healing and breakthrough and transformation from using psilocybin that can really transform public opinion. Um, I've, I've talked with a lot of people who've been skeptical or on the fence or even in some cases oppositional towards uh, psilocybin reform who become either much more curious about learning more or much more supportive after hearing, hearing these individual testimonies of, of success using psilocybin responsibly. Um, and, and that's including even folks on our panel, especially our DA and, and our, our Denver Police Department representative. So, you know, coming off of this really successful year of education and data collection in Denver, um, another purpose of our panel is to make recommendations to Denver City Council. And so we have a comprehensive report that we're submitting to the Denver City Council um, here in about uh, the next month or so. And in that report, uh, the, some of the following, some of the recommend, recommendations that we'll be making are going to include 
expanding upon Initiative 301 to uh, decriminalize gifting and sharing psilocybin without remuneration or without profit, and also uh, decriminalize communal use. Uh, because we really feel like that um, if we're removing some more of, of these enforcement layers, if we're you know, kind of peeling the onion of enforcement and, and removing an additional layer of, of fear for folks to actually gather in community using psilocybin mushrooms, uh, I think we'll have a chance to really see what, you know, what's possible in community um, from folks who, who have the opportunity to, to heal or for healthy, normal people to, um, you know, really ex explore their consciousness or explore their health and well-being using these mushrooms. And so over the course of the summer, we're going to be, um, you know, working directly one-on-one -on -one with members of our city council. Um to essentially work to get them on board for our new ordinance. And we're hoping to, to bring this new ordinance in front of the full city council towards the end of the summer or likely in early fall. And we have this opportunity where we may be in a new state of decriminalization in Denver, um, where we'll have a chance to see what it looks like to, to incubate these communal use or community healing models inside of, um, of a decriminalized area. Mm, that's really interesting. So this is really just taken off. And I think your advocacy and education and, and working as part of this, this um, advisory board has really been instrumental in, in shaping opinions of those that need to be spoken to, the, the district attorney, law enforcement. And I think also what we've seen too is that, you know, what, what Denver did really opened the floodgates to a lot of other municipalities and, and I think was an offering in a way for other communities to do the same. Maybe just speak a little bit about what has happened since this initiative and where things have gone since then. If, if you would have asked me even at the end of our campaign, if I'd still be, be doing this work full time, you know, I, I would have said, I have no idea. And, and it's honestly, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really both, well, has it surprised me? I don't think it's actually surprised me because it's kind of the nature of the mycelial network. You know, you drop a spore <laughs> in a certain area and then, you know, it proliferates. And that's really what we're seeing across the country right now. I mean, huge kudos to decriminalize nature, right? And, mm -hmm. and their organization and, you know, their ability to really mobilize and empower local communities across the country to really take ownership of this movement um, in these in these various jurisdictions. I mean, since we decriminalized in Denver in May of 2019 and Oakland um, shortly thereafter in June of 2019, um, what we've had six other cities follow suit, plus Washington, or excuse me, plus, plus the state of Oregon and Washington, D.C., right? Um, let's see. Um, Santa I got Cruz, Oakland, Santa Cruz, yep, Washington, D.C., Ann Arbor. Yeah, Summer, Somerville, Massachusetts, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And then not to mention now we have, I think over a dozen states in the US this year that have considered some kind of psychedelic reform at the state legislature. And you know we have California with Senate Bill 519 right now that's looking to decriminalize psychedelics in that state. And, and that just passed the Senate Appropriations Committee. So, you know, this is, this is a conversation that's in the zeitgeist for sure. It's in, it's in, in many areas I'm seeing it, it's becoming a much more acceptable and an interesting conversation to have nationwide. And so, you know, while that's exciting and, and like, you know, I'm tremendously proud of the work that's been done um, of all the advocates across the country and especially of all the good work that so many folks here on the panel have done. Um, what I'm really noticing is, is we really have an imperative need for, for more education. Um, and, and more, more, I think more community ownership in this space. And so, you know, there's a, there's a massive ecosystem that ranges from advocates like myself to attorneys, to, to politicians, to, um, you know, to clinicians, to therapists, to doctors, to entrepreneurs, to business professionals. I mean, this is, this movement in and of itself, whether we're talking about reform or whether we're looking at the, you know, the broader ecosystem or industry as a whole, I think has the potential to, um, you know, dramatically transform or change, uh, you know, the, the human experience in this country. And, and I, th I think for me, some of the most promising research that I'm really, really loving on right now is, um, 
I mean, in addition to, of course, all the incredible research showing how psilocybin can be effective for depression, right? Um, I'm also really most excited about research regarding creative potential, creativity um, that can occur when someone uses um, psilocybin or other psychedelics in a structured intentional way. And then also there was a really incredible study that came out from um, Imperial College just a few weeks back that was, it was um, you know, Robin Carhart Harris was a part of this study that looked at um, intersubjective, um, basically, I'm not going to get complicated here, basically that, that psilocybin or psychedelic use in a group experiences creates um, long lasting social benefit, personal and social benefit. And so, yeah. you know, if we can do this responsibly and really prioritize education um, and especially prioritize decriminalization, again, you know, I, I believe this is a human rights issue, then we, I think we can be successful, but we have to, you know, my mantra from the military was slow is smooth and smooth is fast with this. Well, I want to, you know, we'll circle back to some of the, the yeah. maybe the cultural forces that are at, at, at play here. And, and thank you, Kevin, for doing that and taking the time to talk with me. You know, yeah. I will just say this as a, as a personal matter. I, you know, growing up as a kid, I was a huge fan, fan of the Star Trek franchise. And, you know, I was one of the unlucky ones that, that got COVID. And when I was in two weeks of, of quarantine, I binged watch Star Trek Discovery into my surprise there was one of the central pieces around the star trek discovery franchise was the mycelial network which now powers the ship which i just thought was brilliant and they even named the uh, the engineer paul stamets and i, I just got a yeah. big laugh out of all of that so um you know with that i want to turn to representative jeff shipley jeff thanks for joining us today um representative shipley is currently serving a second term in the iowa house of representatives Representative Shipley introduced the nation's first legislative bill to decriminalize psilocybin and other entheogens in 2019 and had his uh, first in the nation legislative hearing on the topic in March of 2021. Jeff, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. I, I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to talk before doing this, but I'm sure I'm glad you made it today and really want to dive in and talk about your your important work and, and leadership on these issues in a state that maybe not a lot of people would think would try to be out front, but maybe I'm wrong about that. I, I have been to the Frank Church Wilderness. That's about all I know about Idaho is when I did a backpack trip through there. But why don't you, why don't you tell me about what you've been up to and let's, let's hear about your, your initiatives. Yes, sir. And again, uh, thank you so much for, for allowing me to join on such an important panel and being with the pioneers in this very important space. Uh, just to be clear, uh, it's, I represent Iowa. Um, I know how I your won't. big city folks love to get us all confused or whatever. We're all Sorry, it's the same flyover states to you guys. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but no, Iowa does pride itself as being first in the nation and uh, in a lot of things. And and um, no, it's just been a wonderful experience. And again, I, I'm just a guy who came to this. I didn't really come in with a lot of understanding of the law or regulation or you know anything like that. I was just a guy that knew if you eat these mushrooms and magical things start happening, and um, figure like I might as well just share this with some people and see where that gets us. So we were able to offer some legislation. We had a very, I thought there's a, a productive hearing um, this year. And again, like, uh, like Kevin mentioned, you drop a spore and the network just naturally happens. That was wonderful this year where uh, we really built that network of more established medical professionals or medical students in some instances of wanting to testify and support of these types of reforms. So that was very exciting to witness. And I think that uh, there's a lot of appetite and just interest in, in these subjects. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what really sparked you to take up the leadership mantle uh, on this issue? I, I mean, was it something personally, did you have some type of professional interest? I mean, what, what was the galvanizing force, if you will, that really decided? Yeah, I, I obviously, I think personally, yeah, I'd say personal experience drove my human behavior. So I was thankful to have, when I was first introduced to the substance, I was thankful to have, um, you know, friends who indicated the importance of intentionality and set and setting and, you know, those very important kind of clinical considerations that um, unfortunately don't always get respected in recreational settings. So I was very fortunate to have that introduction. And I remember you know, myself as a young person um, being very, frankly, scared of the substance, right, which t 
to me then further equaled when I was just scared of what potentially existed inside of me or maybe scared of nature or just, you know, a lot of other corollary fears that come from that. So yeah, it was the personal experience and then just recognizing the urgent need because, um, you know, I'd be sitting around listening to, you know, politicians speak about mental health care and these subjects and, you know, about how much more money they're going to spend or how they want to change the laws. And I was like, well, listen, if we, you know, our laws as they're written right now are tremendously out of alignment with nature and the healing force that's provided to us. Um, and so if we're not talking about these types of issues, we're wasting our time entirely because there's just a whole world of healing out there that's being ignored. So I had personal experience. I saw a critical need for the discussion. And again, like some people ask themselves, you know, um, you know, God, what is something I can do as a person that is that would be pleasing or that no one else could maybe do? And, and thankfully, this opportunity came before me. And it's been a very humbling experience and, and very, very important work um, as I continue the advocacy. Great. Yeah, that's that's really brilliant, Jeff. And thanks for sharing that. So what's what's been the response of your of your constituency to your to your advocacy around these things? Has it been positive, mixed? Oh, Are you getting hate I would mail? Mixed. No, I, I don't I don't get hate mail on this subject. Um, I'd say it's been mixed, but very, you know, cautiously optimistic and curious. Um, it's a little bit of a gag, for instance, where I'll joke about like, oh, if my colleague says something a little bit off color, I'm like, oh, I see to dose them up with mushrooms and straighten him right. You know, so it's kind of been a gag amongst my colleagues of, uh, oh, you know, Jeff's going off again about something. You know, he didn't get his, it's either I did or didn't get the proper dose of mushrooms in the morning. So there's a lot of lighthearted banter about the issue. Um, so generally you know, speaking, other, you're known as the fun guy, right? I, I, well, that's the important thing about <laughs> being in politics. And I mean, for the public affairs officials is just having a very affable presence. And I think this is um, not to get too political, but I think one of the reasons why our state hasn't made more progress on medical cannabis is because the activists who were involved, um, you know, some of them were just kind of unpleasant people who nobody wanted to work with. And just those mm -hmm those kind of dynamics of how you show up in the world and are you someone that people naturally want to be around? Are you someone who unconsciously or deliberately drives people away? Um, that translates very real into this kind of political currency that I'm sure, you know, Ke Kevin knows about, you know, how sensitive some of these conversations are when you're meeting with a police chief or a city councilor on a controversial issue where there still is a lot of fear. So the, 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 I have gotten people who are very like, well, what are you doing? And, um, and it's coming from a place of not understanding. And so it's really just me. I view a function of, can I bait this person's attention enough to where they will take that 15 minutes to listen to someone like Paul Stamets. But um, when I visit with my local county public health people, like a lot of these bureaucrats, at least in rural Iowa, who've been sitting around for maybe 20, 25 years, their entire career, like this is something new and interesting and exciting. And, um, you know, there are a lot of older legislators I work with that might have had some personal experience or friends who had personal experience. And they're kind of like almost that nostalgia of youth I see kind of comes back in their eyes when we talk about some of these things. So there is an interest. Um, just a lot of people maybe don't know because they don't have personal experience, I, would be my suspicion, that they're unwilling to dive in, but they're very happy to sit back and watch the discussion. Yeah, that's great, Jeff. And so talk about your bill itself. What what does it do and, and how far do you think it will get? Uh, yeah, so um, we had a legislative hearing uh, and the bill that we had this year just deleted psilocybin and psilocin from the criminal code. That was the one we got a hearing on. Um, the legislators said, all three of them, um, said they weren't comfortable doing that absent any sort of FDA guidance, which... Um, Anyway, so it was a straight decriminalization bill. And that's been the other thing, too, because as far as Iowa law is concerned, this was something. And again, me just being a guy and needing to learn how the law operates. Iowa does have a right to try law already on the statutes where emergency use use or, um, you know, these exacerbating circumstances could be legally allowable. But we, we lack the code to legally deliver the substances. So it's just interesting how the law works where you kind of carve out these provisions and then a lot more thought and consideration and rulemaking needs to go into 
exactly how you handle these so-called schedule one substances. Um, so anyway, we, we, unfortunately we weren't able to address that. That's a project for next year, but our bill on just straight decriminalizing it drew some really great testimony. We had um, someone show up to the Capitol who was a former um, super heavy meth user and described his experience. We had other mental health advocates come to the Capitol. The, my biggest kind of um, uh, victory was I had one of the Christian lobbyists come and offer testimony. He had, because again, a Christian organization, they have interest in making sure people aren't addicted to drugs. Um, and there are some biblical scriptures that kind of indicate an openness to some of these kind of subjects. So I was able to get, you know, lean on a relationship and, and spin someone off into a different policy area. And I remember just seeing the looks of people's in the room when this very well-established Christian conservative lobbyist offered testimony in support of the decriminalization bill, citing John Hopkins research. Um, to me, that was absolutely hilarious and hysterical. And then the media did note that as like, hey, this is a very interesting coalition that's speaking in favor of this issue. Um, the other thing that happened in that meeting was the they gave everyone a second chance to talk. And then the gentleman who had the meth addiction went off on a um, rant about how he believed this was, again, going back to the, the religious exercise argument. And I mm -hmm. wish I would have been more present in the moment because I could have delivered a very historic line about, hey, we need to get this guy in front of the Supreme Court immediately because it sounds like you're really violating his religious freedom here. Um, unfortunately, it was kind of, anyway, it was a very, interesting kind of event and again just kind of shows why it's so entertaining because you never know what's going to come up and again i mean drug addicts in general are very interesting people um and we need to listen to them mm -hmm. well you raised religious exercise i mean religious exercise is one of the more important pillars of legalization we won't get into it today but there is precedent that went to the supreme court recognizing the religious exercise yeah. with ayahuasca in particular and of course, we have Congress that, you know, has recognized the use of peyote for Native Americans as part of their ceremonial religious use. So there is some precedent out there. Well, for And that's what I bring up in terms of indigenous. like personal advocacy, because I think there is a role there and a case to be litigated that, hey, if you really believe in this stuff, go ahead and let's test these legal theories and let's let's start winning in the courts, too. We've won in Denver. We've won in Ann Arbor. Let's win in the United States Supreme Court. Let's win in the halls of Congress. Let's win in the Iowa State Capitol. And um, so, again, there's just so much opportunity for, for people to advance this cause, even if it means, you know, getting arrested and pleading your case before a judge. That could be, again, very entertaining and politically useful. Great. And thank you, Representative Shipley. Sorry, I got your state wrong. Uh, next time I'll- we'll, Oh, that's all right. We'll make sure you don't make that little... mistake again. We always <laughs> remember Colorado about... though. Thanks for being heroes and pioneers. <laughs> Woo. Great, thank you. All right, with that, yeah. I wanna to turn to Andre Orso. Uh, Andre, thanks for being here today. Mr. Orso is the administrator for the Center for Health Protection within the Public Health Division of the Oregon Health Authority, where he is responsible for the oversight of several public health regulatory and environmental health programs. Mr. Orso started with the Oregon Health Authority in 2015 as the manager of the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program and was involved in the implementation of the state's comprehensive regulatory framework for cannabis legalization. Mr. Orso currently serves on the Oregon Cannabis Commission and is a member of the Psilocybin Advisory Board, where he's working to shape Oregon's psilocybin services program, the first program of its kind in the nation, I'll add, and the establishment of the regulatory framework around psilocybin services in the state. Well, Andre, welcome. Thanks, thanks for having me, Brad. Yeah, well, you are heavily involved in development of what is to be first of its kind, as far as I am aware, for a therapeutic model for use of psilocybin in the state of Oregon. Why don't you just, if, for those folks who don't know, tell us about the journey that led to that, maybe touch on Oregon Measure 110, what that did and, and how we got to where things are today with you now participating in this psilocybin advisory board. Sure. And of course, I didn't need to provide the obligatory, obligatory statement that my views are mine and, and don't necessarily represent the Oregon Health Authority or, or the advisory board, the psilocybin advisory board as a whole. Um, well, you know, I, I think first of all, I'll start with uh, Measure 109 was passed in November of, of, of 2020, 
uh, last year by the voters of Oregon. It's a it's a ballot measure, so it's it goes right into statute in in Oregon law. Um, pretty, you know, I think it was a pretty overwhelmingly vote in favor of of the uh, legalization of the therapeutic use of psilocybin, and and um, I think in a part that you know there's increasing um, public acceptance uh, of the law and then uh, a, a vote for it um, is because people were starting to understand its potential um, in healing and, and therapy. Um, and as that public education campaign ramped up, um, which I was not a part of, I think public opinion started to shift dramatically and we had a vote um, that was uh, not wasn't really close for the state of Oregon. I mean, there, there are geographic areas of, of Oregon that um, may have voted more against it or it had been a little closer vote. Um, and as you mentioned, simultaneously in November, we also had another measure, Measure 110, uh, which decriminalized the small possession of uh, most, most uh, illicit street drugs in the state as well. Um, and that you know, also provides an avenue for people to rather than going to jail for small possessions of, of drugs, uh, they can choose to go into a treatment program uh, and or pay a, a very small fine, like a, a civil penalty rather than a, a criminal penalty. Uh, so, you know, I think that Measure 109 is it's groundbreaking since we're the, we're the first state in the nation to develop uh, or to legalize uh, psilocybin, um, but it really puts some, some good guardrails around it. So to assure uh, people that it might be skeptical about legalization, um, you know, it, it really is very, very prescriptive law. Um, it, it says that we must develop this comprehensive uh, regulatory framework. Um, and that gives some assurances that we're, we're doing this in a uh, safe manner and a manner that's reassuring people that are probably a little bit skeptical of, about uh, psilocybin and the use of uh, uh, these mushrooms. So, you know, I think that, you know, I think that we're, we're on the right track in Oregon. We have a two year development period. So we're taking it nice and slow. Um, of course, you know, regulators always like to have a little bit more time in implementing laws. Um, uh, but, I, but I think that the measure really, uh, it's, a, it's a step in the right direction and can serve as a model for the rest of the country if other states choose to, to go down that path. And walk me through what the measure does as a as a practical or what it envisions as a practical matter. So, like at the end of the at the end of the development of the two year framework, what what will happen? What will um, the citizens of Oregon experience in terms of the ability to access psilocybin at the therapeutic level? Well, you know, I think that the the measure is it's very limited in its scope, right? So it's not the same thing as what we were seeing with uh, cannabis legalization in the past uh, six, seven, eight years, um, where you can walk into a retail store, you prove that you're over the age of 21 and um, grab some cannabis and, and um, go home and enjoy that or whatever. It, it really limits the use uh, and administration of psilocybin to a, a therapeutic setting. Um, and I don't say clinical setting because I think that the measure is open to uh, the administration uh, of psilocybin and its use uh, in, in areas that we wouldn't describe as strictly clinical or uh, what we would be uh, considering like a psychiatrist or a psychologist office. I think there's some, some openness to that in the measure. Uh, however, it, it does restrict its use to someone that we call a psilocybin facilitator. Um, so there are, you know, you can't go into a store and buy it. You'd have to access it within this kind of uh, facilitator therapeutic setting. Um, there are some requirements around uh, sessions that need to be had with the facilitator or the therapist. So there needs to be uh, a pre-session, the administration session where you actually take uh, the drug and then an integrative session afterwards. Um, so it really, builds this structure around therapy uh, rather than, than recreation. Mm -hmm. And then the goal ultimately is to issue licenses uh, for its administration, its production um, and its use uh, by January of 2023. Um, so, you know, 
you know, this, the difference here, I think, with medical, comparing it to medical cannabis, is that in Oregon, we register a medical patient, you know, and that gives you some uh, additional benefits of possession and access that the general public doesn't have when they can go uh, purchase cannabis in a retail store. With, with the psilocybin measure, um, we're not asking the public to register as a patient. You know, that's not going to be on the board. It's really uh, asking the therapist or the facilitator to be licensed, to get the manufacturer or the producer to be licensed. And this service center, which would be, uh, you know, I guess the, the organization or business around the providing of services to get, to get licensed as well. Mm -hmm. And then talk to me about the, the advisory board that was created around the initiative to basically do a framework for implementation. I know you're an active part of that. Maybe talk to me about who some of the other members are and, and what you've been up to recently. I know you have a two-year window to get this completed, but you know how far along are you? You know what what kind of conversations are you having? How active involved is the public or not at this point? Those types of things. Sure. Uh, well, the advisory board. It's the the main objective is to provide recommendations to the health authority on regulating uh, psilocybin uh, and providing those services to the public. So, you know, they are an advisory board, they don't have any rulemaking authority, uh, but they're a very large board, you know, as far as my experience working with boards and commissions, uh, about 17 members, I think. Um, very various backgrounds, very diverse board. Uh, we have uh, researchers from the Oregon Health and Sciences University. We have uh, psychopharmacologists, physicians, psychologists, naturopaths, uh, people that are experts in palliative care, uh, nurses, uh, and members of the public. And we also have toxicologists. So it's just this broad, uh, diverse area of expertise um, that we brought that the measure actually is brought uh, to help advise the health authority on developing its, its regulations. Um, so where we're at today, we're, I think we're gonna have our third meeting this afternoon, uh, Pacific one o'clock Pacific time. All meetings are public. Uh, so the public is invited to, to watch. And of course we abide by Oregon public meeting and public records law. So they are open and transparent, those, those conversations. Um, we don't, really invite the public to comment. Uh, that's kind of done through another kind of legal administrative and rulemaking procedure. Um, but the public can certainly uh, uh, view it. Uh, there is access to it. I think this is our third meeting. So we are meeting monthly uh, for the first uh, two years and uh, really just getting started. Uh, kind of organizing ourselves around areas where there would be regulation and rules. Uh, so a licensure component, how will facilitators be trained? What are the training requirements uh, that are uh, necessary to provide the therapy? Uh, products, how we're gonna deal with, you know, the various types of products that could, could, could appear and that could be uh, administered. Uh, how will those products be tested for safety? Uh, how will they, how will efficacy of those products be assured? Um, and then we also want to look and kind of the overarching theme here with the Oregon Health Authority and, and with psilocybin is, is, of course, viewing things through an equity lens. Um, how is access going to be guaranteed for people that don't, don't necessarily have the means to access it or that actually need the therapy, um, but will have a difficult time accessing it? And affordability is also an issue that we want to tackle um, and would like the board to provide some good advice to, to the agency. Um, of course, there are issues with insurance coverage and we have those issues with, with medical cannabis um, currently. Um, and I suspect that we'll continue to have those issues with, with psilocybin. Um, but you know, if you think about the, the time that uh, it takes to go through the, the sessions to take the, the drug and uh, to go through your trip with the facilitator, that's a lot of hours and that's a lot of labor and that can get very expensive. Um, and we don't want this therapy to be something that is just exclusively for people that can afford it or that people that are elite. We want it to actually be a solution to a lot of the mental health problems that we're having in the state of Oregon. Great, Andre, you're doing great work. So we'll circle back to you in a little bit, but with that, 
and, and thanks, Andre. I want to turn to Catherine Tucker. Catherine, welcome. Ms. Tucker is special counsel at Emerge Law Group, where she co-chairs the Psychedelic Practice Group. Prior to this, Ms. Tucker served as executive director, director of the End of Life Liberty Project, which she also founded. Ms. Tucker has held faculty appointments at Loyola School of Law, the University of Washington, Seattle University, and Lewis and Clark Schools of Law, teaching in the areas of law, medicine, and ethics with a focus on end of life care. Ms. Tucker served as lead counsel representing patients and physicians in two landmark Supreme Court cases, dealing with terminally ill patients, constitutional right to choose aid in dying, and is currently lead counsel in what is sure to be yet another precedent setting litigation in Advanced Integrative Medical Science Institute versus Drug Enforcement Administration, a case currently pending before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals brought by palliative care physicians seeking to legally use a synthetic form of psychedelic mushrooms in patients with terminal illness. Ms. Tucker, Catherine, can I call you Catherine? Sure, yes, of course. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, and honored to speak with you. Uh, I reviewed your your most recent brief, brilliant, brilliantly done, brilliantly done. Thank you. <laughs> Get that Thank out. You. Yeah, very well done. Yeah, super um, interesting. And I want to just dive right into this material, and maybe um, talk to me about how you got interested in, in this whole issue of, of end of life. You know, this is really, I think, a, an important issue for the psychedelic community because. You know, I think what the clinical trials are showing us and what the current literature is showing us is just what an important tool uh, psilocybin can be to help people with terminal illness address the emotional response of, of that diagnosis or that prognosis, right? Yeah. And, and so this just seems to be such a natural segue from the work you were doing on end of life to this advocacy on the behalf of, of use of, of psilocybin in this capacity. So maybe yeah. walk through your, your history there and, and we can start there. And we'll talk yeah, about I mean, too. it's very much of a whole. Um, I have spent 30 some years in advocacy to protect and expand the rights of dying patients. Across that span, that's been a tremendous range of advocacy. Um, and it has included advocacy to ensure that dying patients have as broad a range of choice as possible so that each person can make their journey to death in the manner most consistent with their values, preferences, and beliefs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this may be advocacy to ensure that patients have information about and are able to choose things like hospice care, uh, things like aid in dying, sometimes called death with dignity, um, aggressive pain and symptom management, et cetera. Um, I've also done advocacy to hold providers accountable when, that, when patients' wishes are not respected and patients have bad deaths. Um, so I've done a lot of different work in this domain about empowering dying patients with more and better choices. Um, one of the obvious uh, realizations is that we've done a lot in recent decades in the U.S. to promote better end-of-life care, um, improved pain and symptom management, better access to hospice, better provision of information to patients, and better respect for patient wishes, which is all so good and to be celebrated. But a gap in the toolbox has been something to address non-physical suffering. And that is anxiety and depression that is very common and incredibly debilitating for patients with serious advanced illness. Hence my interest in the amazing studies coming out of the research institutions that look at the efficacy of psilocybin in particular for relief of that form of suffering. And the evidence is that even a single guided session will bring profound, enduring relief. So when I started to see those studies, of course, I got busy with advocacy to um, remove barriers to access. And I was really pleased to be involved in the Oregon campaign where my task was to bring voices from the end of life care community forward in support of the measure. And those voices are so compelling because we most all of us have had a loved one who's had a difficult dying process. 
And so um, it really resonated with voters. Um, and it's important, I think, in any legislative policymaking effort to bring those voices to the table, to the fore. Um, and I'm also really pleased to be working on the first test case to open access to psilocybin therapy in particular, but the case of course has the potential to establish broad principles where other investigational drugs would also be accessible. So this litigation um, is seeking to take advantage of existing state and federal laws that recognize that dying patients don't have the time to wait for the long, slow process of new drug approval to wend its way to completion. And for that population, access to what are referred to as eligible investigational drugs is to be permitted. Psilocybin is one such drug. Um, it doesn't take um, any particularly careful parsing of these statutes to determine that. The requirements to be an eligible investigational drug, successful completion of a phase one clinical trial, and continued investigation in later trials. That is all true for psilocybin. It's also true for MDMA, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so these drugs would properly be deemed eligible investigational drugs under the state and federal right to try laws. So we, um, on behalf of a Seattle clinician and his oncology clinic and several of the cancer patients, uh, approached the DEA to find out how it was going to respect and accommodate what is the law of the land under right to try. And the DEA um, obstructed entirely and said there will be no access to this substance other than as a researcher, which of course is very different than therapeutic use. Um, that opened the courthouse doors and we stepped immediately into the Ninth Circuit on a direct review provision. Um, so, and then we filed for an expedited fast track, which we were granted. So the case is moving at the speed of lightning for lawsuits, uh, which normally are quite slow and cumbersome. But um, we completed our opening brief and filed it on the 14th of May. We were joined in filings this past Friday, the 21st, with five amicus briefs most of them representing large cohorts of amici, friends of the court, including quite remarkably eight states and the District of Columbia joining an amicus brief to say, the sovereignty of the states is at risk here. When mm -hmm. the, a federal agency can vitiate and nullify a duly enacted state law, that is impermissible overreach. And that is constitutionally impermissible with the federalism system that we have in this country. We've already gone down the very well-trod path to establish the legal principle that it is the states, not the federal government, that is the primary regulator of the practice of medicine. That case known as Oregon versus Gonzalez, I represented also the patients and we wanted every level of federal review, district court, ninth circuit and SCOTUS, because again, there we had the DEA seeking to nullify a state's Death with Dignity Act. Uh, the Oregon, again, Oregon was a pioneer in that policy measure. Um, and the DEA tried to obstruct that through exercise of its agency authority and all of the courts threw that out. So when the states saw the DEA essentially nullifying their duly enacted right to try statutes, many of them stepped up and have joined in this uh, proceeding. In addition to the state amici, we did have a very large cohort of end of life advocates, including clinicians, researchers, Roland Griffiths, who many of you will know as kind of the eminence of the modern research uh, uh, and uh, the head of the Johns Hopkins clinical research. He is one of our amici. We have past presidents of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine speaking again to this important tool needed in the palliative care toolbox. Um, we had the ACLU on the civil liberties front and we have the Cato Institute on the conservative think tank front. So, 
an incredible uprising from across the country to say the DEA has overstepped and the court must set that right. We hope that will happen in short order and we hope that patients will soon be able to access psilocybin therapy. And including in Oregon, this would very likely open access for that population well in advance of Measure 109 uh, taking effect in 2023. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is critically important work you're doing, Catherine, and, and thank you for that. And just speaking personally from someone who has had relatives uh, with terminal illness, you know, having these therapies available to them, I think, would have made their, their end of life much more peaceful, perhaps, for them, you know, especially yes. with things like cancer and you know, and just watching them go through that struggle. So this is really, in my mind, very important work that you're, you're doing here. So thank you personally for this. Um, for those that don't know, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals is just one step before, below the U.S. Supreme Court. So as a legal matter, once this gets uh, decided one way or the other before the Ninth Circuit, um, this could be headed to the U.S. Supreme Court. So this is definitely going to be, a, I, I think, a case to watch. And given, Although highly the, unlikely, if I could say, Brad, because let's remember, this is a case of first impression. There are no other cases under right to right. try laws in reported decisions. So normally, as you know, as a federal court litigator, um, the SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States, accepts very, very, very few cases. And it typically employs a criteria of a split in the federal circuits as one of the primary reasons it would take a case. So mm -hmm. if the Ninth Circuit rules on this, well, it will rule one way or the other, um, there's not really an impetus for the SCOTUS to take the case until a different federal circuit court rules and creates a split. Uh, it's hard to imagine SCOTUS wanting to reach out and take this case. Um, so I just wanna share that. I, I think that when the Ninth Circuit rules, it is likely for at least some considerable period of time to be the definitive ruling uh, with application, of course, binding in the Ninth Circuit and all the states in that circuit, but very likely with national import because we are talking about um, a federal enactment uh, and 41 states sprinkled across the country. Correct. That compassionate use was not 2018 statute. And, and you are correct on that. You know, the Supreme Court. Right to for try. It's those, called right, right to try. Right to try. Yeah. 2018. Right. Well, thank you so much. Um, and with that, I want to open up to a group discussion. Thanks to all of you for sticking around. Jeff, welcome back. Andre, welcome back. Kevin. Um, you know, let's let's talk about some of the driving forces for the legal access. To, to psychedelics, um, you know, this thing has really picked up a lot of steam. And I think from all of your presentations and our discussions, you can see various aspects of what's going on from, from you know, implementation of these therapeutic models to municipalities that are getting out front with decriminalization of not just, you know, psilocybin anymore, but broadly with theogens, we have, uh, States like Iowa, where Representative Shipley is out front introducing legislation. Uh, and then we have this, this precedent setting litigation where you know, folks like Catherine are really pressing the envelope to ensure that you know, patients, medical patients, have access to these in, important resources uh, at, a, at a critical time in their uh, healthcare lives, right? And so maybe speak to me about what you all see as the driving forces behind these, uh, this legal push or this, what I'm seeing is almost like a legal sea change uh, and what you think might be some of those things driving this. Kevin, well, I think it's I the like research. I mean, I think Go we... Ahead, I think it, the research is driving this, these incredible findings, um, which really uh, you cannot look at and not immediately see the promise. And there are so many mental health issues. I mean, my focus has been in the context of terminal illness, but certainly other populations um, are hugely benefited by these substances. And I'm thinking 
again, another very powerful voice is the veteran community and uh, veterans who are debilitated with PTSD and are not responding to conventional therapy are having remarkable improvement and return to function and to, to living a life that is um, meaningful to them after having treatment with these medicines. So I think it's the research driving a broad grassroots uh, eagerness and, and momentum to see these become available. Mm, absolutely. Kevin, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I, I actually really agree with Catherine. I was going to say that I, I think the, the research was, at least for us in Denver, a primary motivating factor. Um, and especially for myself as a veteran, you know, my first introduction to, um, you know, researching some of these substances was through the work that MAPS was doing and at the time the Hefter Institute. So, you know, it, the research is, is incredibly important. And if we're considering, you know, policy reform, and especially if we're working with, you know, lawmakers or bureaucrats or other folks who are, you know, associated with the government, you know, the data really goes a long way. Um, and, and I think also in terms of the general public or, or you know, laypersons around this and folks who, who for lack of a better term, are, are indoctrinated into the messaging from the Controlled Substances Act about the danger of these substances, like the research <laughs> invalidates <laughs> all of that um, and, and demonstrates that, yes, these are safe when used responsibly. You know, the, the LD50 for psilocybin mushrooms is like more than you can possibly eat in a single sitting. And so, you know, we need more research. And the other, the other thing I'll, I'll add on here quickly, and if you'll allow me to get a little esoteric, you know, this is something that I've been really noticing, at least from my experience in this space, is that in, in so many ways, this movement, being a mycelial movement, and, you know, including all entheogens, it, to me, it seems it kind of has a mind of its own, which I know is hard for a lot of folks to grasp. So I think that, you know, uh, at least from what I'm seeing, a lot of us who are interested in this work and, and people who may become more interested in becoming an advocate or doing research, you know, all, all it really takes is to express an interest and, and to make the connections because this movement's very open, you know, at least from what I'm saying and speaking for myself, you know, folks who are deeply involved and embedded in the grassroots movement, you know, we want to actively share this information with people because we need as many folks kind of on the front lines and educated about this right now to, to really transform public opinion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, hold on. Let me. I just want to expand on what yes, Kevin just said because there's a lot of important points there. Uh, yeah, I, I think that there is this larger kind of consciousness type thing happening when we just look at where we are in human evolution and how many human beings are walking the planet completely ignorant of just how many mycelium are operating in the soil that they walk on. I mean, that's kind of the moment in time we are at where human beings are very technologically capable yet we're still very ignorant of the world we live in, in many ways. And the mushroom kingdom uh, is definitely emblematic of that. And then further, I think what, what needs to be mentioned in terms of driving this is the legitimate and urgent human need that we are in need of this healing, that um, I, crisis of identity, crisis of mental health. I have been plaguing society for a long time, uh, certainly within the last year. You know, this has come to the forefront in, in an even new way about just you know, what it means to be a healthy, fully realized human, how our neuroplasticity is influenced by, again, these uh, technology and electronics and all these other things. So it is in this moment of time where I think the mushrooms are emerging as a very um, important remedy to these kind of human afflictions that we're, we're experiencing as a species. And then in terms of just the other thing, because this is something that I have a couple of constituents that voice this all the time of, and I think uh, maybe some of Kevin's activism might have touched on this, but again, being like a truly grassroots movement of allowing this to be democratized where any person can, you know, cultivate a spore and cultivate their own medicine versus is this something that's going to end up again, corporate corporate, if the corporatocracy is going to take it over and this is going to be just another natural remedy that somehow, you know, while, 
decriminalized or legalized, there's still a barrier between direct human experience and just exactly what that kind of looks like. So there's still just a lot of different dichotomies emerging on how these policies could be enacted. Um, anyway, those were the comments I wanted to throw in there. And, and thanks for the question. Uh, that's excellent. Excellent points, Jeff. Um, I want to shift just a little bit. And, and one of the things we have not talked about is, is a, a federal interplay with some of these measures and initiatives and how that is playing out um, with, with all these legalization measures. Um, and I know, Andre, you and I had, had spoke before this about federal involvement or lack thereof in, in the Psilocybin Advisory Board. And you know whether or not at the end of the day, you know you're going to see uh, maybe even a heavy-handed federal approach. I will start that with a caveat by saying maybe the marijuana legalization movement, right, has introduced us to the idea that we have a much more cooperative federalist system when it comes to these legalization measures. But I'm wondering how this plays out on the ground. You know, and I remember in the early days of, say, marijuana legalization in the state of California, when the medical initiative first came online, you know, we, we saw the, the federal government, you know, because of the power of the Controlled Substances Act, taking a very heavy handed approach and not with patients, but with medical professionals who wanted to carry out provisions of the law. Um, how are you all getting out ahead of those issues? Are you having conversations with US government officials? How are those going? What are they saying? Has the marijuana movement opened some doors that maybe would not have been opened? So maybe if one of you wants to speak to that, Andre, since you and I have already talked about that, maybe if you could just jump in and share your sure. thoughts on that. Sure, thanks, Brad. Well, I mean, the federal government's uh, role or possible interference in Oregon's experiment is, is concerning to, to the state. Um, there is a, a, a provision in, in Measure 109 that instructs the Oregon Health Authority and the advisory board to start engaging the U.S. Attorney's Office um, to discuss these matters and discuss the, the federal conflicts that are inherent in the permissiveness of state law versus the restrictiveness of the Controlled Substances Act. Um, with medical cannabis, you know, during the Obama administration, I think most people were that we had something called the Cole Memorandum, which wasn't law, but it was uh, some instructions related to prosecutorial discretion, right? So it was instructions to state uh, U.S. attorneys throughout the country to say, look, if states are doing these things, you know, if they're keeping uh, the substance out of the hands of children, if they're somewhat, you know, controlling diversion, um, and if they're having all these other regulatory structures in place, leave them alone, let them do what they, they need to do. Um, and I wanna thank Catherine for forwarding a, a, an excellent law review article earlier this week um, that really asks that and, and proposes that same uh, situation for psilocybin uh, to have some sort of federal memorandum from the US Attorney's Office that says, okay, if states have some certain regulatory boundaries and controls over uh, psilocybin, then let them, let them do what they want to do. You know, let the states kind of be the laboratories of democracy and, and figure out um, for themselves how they want to allow access to their citizens to these types of substances. So I think that's a goal for, for us in Oregon is to get that sort of cooperation from the federal government. Uh, now we're kind of strategically waiting to engage uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office right now. Uh, we don't have a... a a presidentially appointed U.S. attorney for the state of Oregon yet. You know, I think there's still some transition with the U.S. Department of Justice and getting all their U.S. attorneys appointed. Um, so, but it is something that we we certainly want to have those conversations. We want to see the perspective of the U.S. Attorney's Office um, way before we start issuing licenses. You know, we're issuing licenses in, in 2023, but we kind of like to see, you know, what's What's the attitude of, of the U.S. Department of Justice? Um, what's their tolerance for letting states uh, do what they what their elected citizens have asked them to do? Um, because you know they they really they really can throw a wrench in things and they can stop stop things in their tracks. Um, and there are legitimate concerns that the federal government may may have you know around the con controlled su you know, substances like Schedule One uh, substances. Uh, 
but I think they need to let the states have a chance to prove that we can have a re well regulated system that considers safety um, and, and doesn't endanger the, the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to jump in. This is an area of particular interest of mine. Um, and it is something that will be critically important because the feds can shut down entirely mm -hmm. the Oregon experiment if they so choose. Um, so achieving a detente, um, a respect for the state experimenting in this way as Oregon has chosen to do um, that's going to be essential. And one of the signal differences uh, that I want to point out is that, as Andre mentioned earlier, Measure 109 is an incredibly heavily regulatory measure. Every single player who would have a role, whether as a manufacturer, a grower, a supplier, a dispenser, a facilitator, a facilitation center, all of those players must be licensed under the Oregon measure to be in compliance with Oregon law. What does that do vis-a-vis -vis federal exposure? Well, as the article I shared with Andre put it exactly right, those registrants are then sitting ducks for federal enforcement. So this is not like cannabis, where in the early days, there was not much regulation. And so it would have been very difficult for federal enforcement to be successful. Not so here. The ducks are sitting on roosts uh, for federal enforcement action. So if there isn't a successful cooperative federalism negotiated, the Oregon measure will be shut down. And if I could add something, I think sure. politics certainly has a lot to play here. Um, with medical cannabis, by the time the 2009 coal memorandum came out, we had uh, over a dozen states that uh, or had at least me legalized medical cannabis. And by the time that we had full legalization in Colorado, Washington, Oregon, um, I think for the first three states, uh, we started to see this groundswell of, of opinion um, changing in, in, the, in the country. So there was this kind of political backing from the people to show that look, it's probably not smart for the federal government to start heavily prosecuting medical uh, states that have legalized medical cannabis. The risk here with Oregon is that we're, we're by ourselves. We're the first state to do this. So th the political risk for the U.S. Attorney's Office to come after Oregon and to stop the experiment in the state is probably less, uh, and, and the reaction from the public will probably be less than, than it was for medical cannabis. So that's just the perspective and kind of a, a fear that I have in my mind is that there isn't enough political backing from the people yet to really give the federal government pause on, is this a smart move to stop this experiment in Oregon? Mm -hmm. And what's so and, interesting about that, if I could just say, is I do think all of these efforts can come to support each other because I think if the RTT effort is successful and suddenly psilocybin therapy is accessible across the country for patients with serious illness, that is going to significantly increase public and professional awareness of the benefit of this medicine. And I think that could catalyze the kind of support you're alluding to, Andre. I'll, I'll jump in here, Brad, and, and just add a couple other points from a, a different angle. Yeah, quickly, um, then I'm going to start to wrap us up too. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah, so if, if we look at um, Washington, D.C.'s Entheogen Decriminalization Initiative that was passed last year at the ballot, that actually had to get congressional approval before it became law in Washington, D.C., and, and they had, um, that was successful in Oregon, um, excuse me, in, in D.C., and then we have um, you know, we have uh, federal officials like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, publicly messaging, uh, reforming laws around psilocybin focused on healthcare and new models for healthcare. And then, you know, I, I think one of the barriers here where, where we may start to see um, some more change at the federal level is in terms of the cost of research. Um, you know, it's, it's tens of millions of dollars to conduct research with, with psilocybin and other, other, and other, other drugs like this, other substances. So there's an organization that was 
that's called the Plant Medicine Coalition that was spearheaded by Melissa Lavasani, who ran the DC campaign. And they're working directly with federal officials in Congress to um, you know, reduce the, some of the financial barriers to, to research because we need more research too. Yeah, well, I think what we're, what we're highlighting here really is this is one of the big cons of the, the states' rights and the local control initiatives is that there's always the boogeyman of uh, federal intervention at some level, even the, the coal memorandums, which were referenced, which were in the context of marijuana, those are not enforceable. Um, you know, they're basically a guidance document. You can't hold the federal government accountable to it. Yes, it was there. And yes, it was pulled under the, you know, once the Obama administration left office, right? So, you know, the, I think the only real true fix at the end of the day is either federal legislation that, you know, significantly reforms the Controlled Substances Act or some type of descheduling or lesser scheduling of, of controlled substance. That's the only real... <clears throat> legally speaking, workaround that's going to be available or some of these other measures like the Right to Try Act that Catherine is litigating under. Um, and this has been a terrific conversation, by the way. And uh, unfortunately- One last point have... though. Can I wrap sure, up? Jeff, go ahead. If Quickly, you're ever talking I... to a public, if, you're, if you're talking to a public policy official, just don't assume them that they have any understanding of any of these issues whatsoever. Because these are a lot of complicated legal questions. And I think sometimes it's like people assume that the lawmakers know what these words and concepts are, and that's a dangerous assumption to make. So anyway, just wanted to throw that out there um, to make it clear. Great, thanks, Jeff. So we only have a couple minutes left, and you know, I I, I threw out some questions for you in advance of this this roundtable discussion, and you know, I think what I'd like to wrap up is have each of you prognosticate a little bit on where things might be down the line as we, as we head into continued legalization efforts. And so I, I'd like each of you to answer the question of where do you think psychedelics legal status will be five years from now, 10 years from now, or 20 years from now? And just quickly give me your answer and any final wrap up thoughts and you might have. And Kevin, since we began with you, let's, let's start with you. Awesome, yeah, thanks Brad. So I think five years from now we'll have another handful of states that have created some kind of uh, regulatory model similar to Oregon, including decriminalization. Um, and, and that would you know, either through ballot initiative or at the state legislature. 10 years from now, um, it's hard for me to even think that far ahead because it's like one, one step at a time. But I, I, think, I think in 20 years, um, these medicines will be much more widely accessible from a therapeutic perspective and, and I hope decriminalized. And I. I don't see any future where if we're prioritizing decriminalization and equitable regulated services models, we're not going to see a need for adult use recreational like cannabis. Mm. Okay. Jeff? Um, I'll say this, that laws and all this stuff and politics is really just a function of human willpower. So as long as the people are leading and conducting their own experiments, I don't honestly think it's that consequential what the laws do or do not say, as long as the people themselves are taking the responsibility. And I think that's what I'm seeing is that left, right, and center. And just imagine in your own life, you, you come across these people all the time and just like, if that person could just have a one and a half gram therapy session, they would be so much more pleasant to be around. You know, like there's these people are everywhere. Everyone needs these things. And thankfully people are leading on their own, like we mentioned. And, and his personal experience is going to create that familiarity across society where people are going to be comfortable in this direction. So that would be my encouragement to everyone. Just obviously, you know, say your prayers, lead to the fullest extent that you can as a human being and use your willpower. And then, and then the leaders, the laws and these constitutional, you know, judicial rulings will likely follow favorably in the wake of, of human beings charting their own destiny as individuals. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Andre? Uh, five years from now, I think that Oregon will have a thriving uh, psilocybin therapy uh, framework. Uh, and I think that we're going to start seeing some positive outcomes associated with that, with uh, looking at the population's mental health conditions. Uh, I also see a few other states, as, Jeff, as Kevin mentioned, like probably pursuing the, the same path that Oregon did. 
Uh, 10 years from now, we'll probably start seeing some competition between state regulatory systems and FDA approved drugs. Uh, and then deciding, you know, if state systems are, are necessary. Uh, and then 20 years from now, I, I hope that the next generation will probably be looking back on this time with, with some humor, uh, saying, I can't believe how, how uptight and ridiculous uh, everybody was and that these, these uh, substances are, 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 you know, very helpful for everybody. And, and it's just uh, a part of our, our ongoing culture. Great, thanks, Andre. Catherine? Oh, you're, you're on mute, Catherine. Catherine, you're on mute. Sorry, Thank I'm you. on that optimistic page that Andre just drew for us. Um, I do think we're gonna see likely rescheduling, which will um, make these substances available, um, certainly within a physician clinical setting um, and possibly wider. And so, you know, I think these are really important efforts to push that forward. Uh, as is the ongoing clinical research. But I think, yeah, we are shortly going to be looking at wider accessibility. Yes, yes, great. Um, I have been given the green light to ask uh, another question if you all have time. Is that okay with everyone? Do you have an another minute? Okay, great. We got, a, I will tell you, we got a whole bunch of questions, but I'm, I'm gonna try to get to the 14,000 foot level questions. And, and um, let's talk about, just, just briefly, who in your view really has been the opinion shapers for the psychedelic legalization movement? You know, the people you've looked to to really help maybe the, 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 uh, the thinkers, the advocates, you know, I think all of you are doing your part. I feel like I try my best to do my part in, in this ever-growing movement, but maybe talk about the folks that, that you've looked to past, present, uh, and maybe even down the road, you know, so, and, and uh, we'll go same order. Kevin, we'll start with you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, my, a big part of my primary motivation is, is for my son, like what Catherine mentioned, you know, 20 years down the road, we'll, we'll likely see wider accessibility because um, I want him to grow up in a world where, you know, he has access to these medicines to heal, right? And, and the tools and the education and the resources necessary to make that happen and to, you know, to utilize psilocybin and psychedelics as, you know, for what they are as, as a reminder of what it means to be human and how to create, you know, healthy patterns in our lives. Um, it's hard for me to, um, well, David Bronner and, and Dr. Bronner's and, you know, all of the work they've really been doing behind the scenes, you know, David's uh, turning into a close friend and he's really He's been a huge motivator, not only and not to mention, you know, his organization funding a significant majority of this movement. So that's been a huge blessing, um, you know, both for me personally and and for a lot of these movements across the country. Um, and honestly, like, you know, there are so many um, activists and advocates out there, you know, decriminalized nature and Carlos Pozzola comes to mind and that whole organization. And and really, at the end of the day, to me, it's like, you know, what what we learned in Denver is that every single small move we took made a difference. Every single point of contact we made made a difference because we won by such a small margin in, in Denver. And so, um, you know, really just it's, it, it's the people, the people who are putting in their time and energy in this movement and many of whom aren't being compensated for it. So it's truly a blessing and an honor to be able to be on this panel and, and you know, represent those folks in, in some sort of a way. Yeah, great. Thanks, Kevin. Jeff, quickly, you want to weigh in on that? The question is, who are the inspirations? Okay, so um, for me, this year, it was a great honor. I was able to connect uh, with uh, Paul Stamets and then also Dennis McKenna. And I think those guys were kind of legendary ethnopharmacists, whatever they call themselves. Um, and for me, just personally, this might sound a little cheap or whatever, but um, I only learned about Paul Stamets through the Joe Rogan podcast. And I remember when I was kind of like cultivating my political ambition, like I was thinking about basically impressing L.A. comedians because uh, there was like Rogan and then Ari Shafir and a guy named Duncan Trussell. You know, they'd kind of been comedians in this space and that kind of L.A. comedy scene. And, you know, for me as a young 20 something like, you know, they made me laugh. So I, I wanted to kind of be accepted from that. And that kind of motivated me to 
you know, again, like write the, the decriminalized psilocybin bill for Iowa. So anyway, uh, but again, a lot of other people, and then just on something Kevin said about just how razor thin some of these margins are, I think that again, just underscores how important it is for everyone to be involved because we've seen this in American politics in many, many different ways, how it really is a s- small margins do end up, you know, hinging gigantic shifts in policy or candidates, et cetera. So it's very important that people are plugged in and engaged um, in, in these political circumstances. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Andre, quickly, we're, I need to start wrapping things up. Today. Sure. Uh, personally, just the the researchers and the, the personalities in mainstream media really kind of put this in the forefront. Obviously, the advocates uh, like Kevin. Um, but really, you know, it's going to sound a little cheesy, but we really open the door is just the people of the state of Oregon, their openness uh, and willingness to, to try something new that they think has a lot of potential. Yeah. Catherine? Uh, yeah, I credit Roland Griffiths, Rick Doblin, the early in the trenches, long-term researchers to this renaissance of research as catalyzing all that we've talked about today. And then, yes, we have to acknowledge those willing to support the work in this space, like David Bronner and the Dr. Bronner Company. And, um, you know, everyone who's interested in this can support this work in one way or another. And um, I hope people will think to do that because it doesn't happen without support. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll just say for myself, um, because this topic never really came up and, you know, this wasn't our focus, but the people who are engaged on the, on the front of religious exercise with entheogens are people that really speak to me. I mean, there's a long history of use of naturally occurring psychedelics for religious exercise. And there are a lot of people now on the forefront, right? Continuing with advocacy along those lines. And I think that is an important part of our journey. And I, I'm thinking someone who's really close to me is my good friend, um, Dr. Joe Tafur who's part of the church in the Condor and Eagle, who's really been trying to advance the conversation around religious exercise with ayahuasca. And also Bia Labate, who runs the Chikruni Institute is another one of my personal inspirations. So with that, this has been an excellent discussion. I wanna thank all of you, Kevin, Jeff, Andre, Catherine, uh, and Deborah, thank you so much for putting this together and being a fantastic host as always. You're very sweet. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I think everyone can agree that um, to answer your question, that there are just so many pieces of this puzzle that are helping forward it, and, and you guys are all leading, real leaders in this battle. So, you know, I thank you. We all thank you. I know that the attendees could not stop asking questions and chatting. So thank you to Kevin, Andres, Jeff, Catherine, for your phenomenal work, work, Brad, of course, for moderating and all of your work in this field. And um, I look forward to hosting you all again. Um, just to mention, in July, we're already setting up the SciTech Summit. So we'll look forward to seeing you all there. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be hashtag hash it out. So we're going to be discussing anything and everything that has come up that you've tagged and tweeted about this year. So again, thank you all very much and have a great day to everybody. <laughs>